Great Lakes dunes are among the largest freshwater dune systems in the world. Plants in these dune ecosystems may respond differently to the projected changes in temperature and precipitation due to climate change. Lucas Bell Duresky is a PhD student working to determine these effects on the coastal dune vegetation of Lake Michigan. Here Lucas talks about an experiment he has conducted to find out how climate change may affect the vegetation in the dunes of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore located in western Michigan. This is my dissertation project which I named Decisive, which is Dune Endophyte Competition Interaction and Storm Intensity Variability Experiment. This project was funded by the National Science Foundation in the form of a pre-doctoral fellowship and also the George Melendez Wright Climate Change Fellowship Program, which is a partner with the National Park Service. So this project is really focused on how climate change will affect the dune plant community. Climate change is expected to increase the variability in rain events and actually increase these extreme rain events. In the Great Lakes dunes, we're expected to see nearly a 50% increase in large storm or large rain events during the summer months. I was interested in actually how will this affect the dune plant community. So in this experiment, I test a 35% increase in precipitation across all the dune plants. So the precipitation treatments that are in these plots are either ambient, which is just normal rain, a weekly rain event, which is just a 35% increase that's applied to the plots in weekly events. Or extreme rain events, which are rain events that are applied in one large application during each month. I'm also interested in how plant-plant interactions may actually be altered by these altered precipitation. So plots are either in mixtures or monocultures. In monoculture plots, all plants are planted only with conspecifics, only allowing within species interactions. In mixture plots, plants are all interspersed randomly, allowing for interactions between plant species and within plant species. So this is a mixture plot. This, in these plots, we allow all plants to actually interact and to compete both above and below ground. The six species are beach grass, which is the dominant, three grass species, which are little blue stem, sand reed, and Canada wild rye, one herbaceous species, which is common milkweed, and one woody, which is sandbar willow. So this is American beach grass. This is our dominant plant species in the Great Lakes dunes. It's also the primary dune builder, so it stabilizes the sand in the Great Lakes and allows for succession of other plant species after it, st it stabilizes the sand. This is always the dominant plant species in every plot that, of my experiment. I'm really interested to look at how climate change uh, projected alterations in precipitation may affect its growth and its competition with other plant species. This is little blue stem. This is a common Great Lakes dune grass. And it actually competes and interacts with beach grass in about the middle of the uh, dominance of beach grass along the successional sequence in the dunes. This is sand reed. This grass species actually outcompetes beach grass in later successional zones in the Great Lakes dunes. So this is Canada wild rye. This is a common dune plant species that is in the later succession of the primary successional zones. So this is a really great species and it's the closest related to American beach grass of the plants that are in these, these plots. This is common milkweed. This is a common herbaceous plant species in the Great Lakes dunes plant community. It's pollinated and acts as food for monarch butterflies. This is sandbar willow. This is the woody plant species that are in my experimental plot. And this woody plant is really common in the first dune sequence and competes with beach grass. This is a sandbar willow, and these are some ants that are actually tending some aphids that are feeding on the willow plant. Okay, so this is the mile and a half walk that we take every day, and we have to carry out anything we need for the day with us. We, uh, when we started the project, we had to bring out about 1,500 feet of irrigation, about 360 sprayers, the 500-gallon uh, tank, 325 feet of garden hose, 
and then also 4,860 plants. Um, on a daily basis, we have to carry out anything we need for sampling, anything we need for, for doing any of the fixing on the garden hoses, anything we need to actually to measure the pH or to uh, all the food we need for, for our lunches. So it's a, it's a pretty good walk, about three miles a day, at least we, we hike a day. So this is a solar panel that, this solar panel is actually charging a um, battery here. And that battery is going to power the, the pump. This is the solar pump, which pumps water from the tank out into the plots. This is the nutrient injector, which adds a little bit of stock solution composed of a small amount of nitrogen to mimic the chemistry of rainwater before we add the water to the plots. This is the filter that's removing some of the fine particulate that is coming from the lake water. These are Xeric sprayers that we use to actually increase the precipitation in these plots. So this is our tank that we actually pump the lake water into. And what we have to do is we have to treat the lake water to reduce the pH to mimic rainwater, which is about a pH between 4.7 and 5.2. And lake water is really at a pH of about 7 to 8. So Tamara is going to put in the probe and actually check out the pH of the, the water that we have in this tank. So it's important to mimic the chemistry of lake water because there's a chance that there could be confounding effects due to having a higher pH water added to the plots. What we're going to do next is add citric acid. So Tamara is going to add about 350 milliliters so we can drop the pH to around that 5.2 to 4.7. So since the citric acid is in powdered form, we need to mix it up. And we have a um, homemade mixer that's built from a paint mixer and a cordless drill. And we mix up the water just so we can get a uniform pH through the, throughout the entire tank. So we don't have any pot, patches of really acidic or really basic water high or low pH. And we have a, as uniform as possible pH throughout the entire tank. So as we're adding water to these plots, we're not adding a burst of acid or a burst of, of just basic solution. So we're gonna check a pH again and see if it's going up a tad. So the pH is 4.3, which is in within the range of 4.3, 4.4, within the range of what the pH of rainwater would be. We also always check the pH of the hose going to the pump just to check to make sure that our treatment of this water is uniform as possible. This water goes out to the plots and this is the water we actually use to, uh, to actually increase the precipitation in these plots. This is a data logger that is actually logging soil moisture every half an hour from probes that are in each of these plots. We use this to measure how our alterations in precipitation affect the soil moisture in these plots. These are plant root simulators. They capture nutrients as they flow through the soil and so we can measure how our plant manipulations and precipitation manipulations affect the flow of nutrients through the soil. This is a bamboo stake that we use to measure sand accretion or sand accumulation and the shift in sand throughout the year. So this is a pitfall trap. It's a 50 milliliter tube that we put in each plot so we can capture insects as they crawl through the plots. This is a pitfall trap from one of our plots where we actually have ants 
harvestmen, or day long legs, and a moth. The third aspect of this experiment, which is still ongoing, is the effects of a fungal endophyte within beach grass on the plant-plant interactions. So beach grass, being the dominant, may have a large role in the plant community interactions. So we manipulated the endophyte within beach grass, and this fungal endophyte has been found to increase the growth of its host. This increase in the host growth may actually affect the plant-plant interactions through increased competitive interactions. This project has many benefits for the Park Service. These plants that I've actually put into the ground acts as a high diversity restoration. So planting all of these genotypes taken from the surrounding area has led to a restarting of succession in this system. Another benefit is testing how these alter precipitation will provide good information for land managers who are interested in using restoration in the face of climate change.